We're moving on to the first of the keynote sessions, and it's entitled, We All Have a Role in the Player's Journey. This, uh, this session is going to be delivered by two people who are members of the Talent Academy Review Committee set up at Crow Park, who produced a report in December 2019 uh, that reviewed many recommendations, including the development of the player pathway, which we're trying to focus on today. And next day, we'll have a presentation from Ulster GA Director of Coaching and Games Development, Dr. Eugene Young. And Eugene will then bring in Monaghan's Garrett Coyle. Garrett's been a member of Ulster GA Coaching and Games Development Committee as a coaching officer for his county in Monaghan, and is also representative for Ulster Schools Committee. So please welcome Eugene to commence his presentation now. Good morning, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the fireside chat with Tony, John, Mark and Arne. I think a wealth of experience and expertise in that group. And it was great to hear their opinions and that it's about player improvement, building relationships and looking after <coughs> excuse me, players through better communication. Some great insights there. And I like the, the piece about academies are not necessarily the beginning of the journey or the end of the journey. But if we can keep players in academies, I think as Aaron said, then it's, there's a better chance of success. So that all feeds in nicely to both my, my session and, and Roger's session this morning. Um, before I start, I want to do a quick thank you to O'Neill's again for their continued support, to all of the de delegates and for, for the donations that you're making now towards pros prostate cancer research, to our staff in the back room here for delivering, hosting and facilitating the session, and to our provincial committee and members of our volunteers, uh, Tiki, Benny, Gard, Connor, for their input during the, the planning and the delivery of today. And to you, our guests at the fireside, already mentioned, and to our guest speaker, Paul Kilgannon, uh, as well as the round table participants later on, Michael and Desi, Michael Murphy and Desi Moen. So we'll have, a, we'll have a short intermission between some of the sessions as well to grab a coffee, so please take full advantage of that. Both our title today is Understanding a Role in Shaping the Player Journey. And as Jimmy mentioned, both Garrett and myself were involved with the, the National Committee uh, and involved in some of the research that was done uh, in terms of collecting information to inform that. The journey, I suppose, suggests that there's a road or a path that the players travel along. And as we all know, with every road, there's turns and twists, there's slip roads and there are obstacles and quite often blockages. Along the road, there may be people to stop who will give you directions. Uh, and sometimes there's nobody to stop and we head off in the wrong direction and we can dra drive for miles before we can actually uh, find out where we are. <clears throat> so I hope this analogy fits with what we're trying to achieve today. So in the session today, I'm joined by Gart Coyle from St. McCartan's Monaghan. Gart is also involved with the Ulster Schools and was part of Malachi O'Rourke's backroom team uh, during their successful run. Uh, he's also the coaching officer in Monaghan, and I was trying to work out for how long. It must have been around eight years, and has been instrumental along with their, their coaching officer, uh, Paul O'Connor, in establishing the pathways in the, in the, in the county. So, Garrett, you're very welcome. Cheers, Eugene. Thanks. Appreciate it. So, what I want to do is reflect really on, the, on this report produced in 2019, but in particular, the framework that it presents. Uh, some of you may well have been involved in the consultation nights in your county, all 32 counties, hosted a consultation night that engaged parents, players, staff, teachers, service providers, full-time staff, uh, and administrators. And this engagement helped shape the report that emerged. So we hope to reflect a little on pieces of that report. We want to look at what it says to us as coaches that manage players. We want to look at the environment and how we manage this. And this was alluded to in the fireside chat. And finally, we want to look at some of the levels of collaboration and communication that uh, John McElhom actually alluded to in his piece, uh, and how we as coaches can influence this and engage in our own personal development so we can maximise the potential of the players that we put through our hands. So our starting premise on all of this is that there are a lot of stakeholders in the player's journey, and we as coaches need to take responsibility and facilitate a coordinated approach to player development. I suppose insights are uh, very important and um, you know, all good plans and policies and programmes should be underpinned by evidence. And it was good to hear Aaron uh, talking a wee bit about the Sports Science Work Group and the work that they're undertaking. I suppose over the last 20 years, and it's hard to believe I'm working with the association for 20 years, but we've tried to underpin what we do with research and with feedback from our coaches. And these are some of the documents here that, uh, that we've produced over the years. I suppose more, more recently, we've uh, been involved with the club audit. And I, I want to take the ch chance here to... Uh, to thank all of you and your clubs for your responses to the audit. We had over 95% returns to our audit from the 360-odd clubs in Ulster, which is absolutely fantastic. And that has helped in us 
to shape what we want to do moving forward. I think from the audit, uh, what we have found uh, in particular to this uh, presentation is that the small clubs, the small and medium sized clubs were seeking more support. Uh, they wanted help to plan their coaching programs. They wanted coaching support in their clubs, directly in their own clubs with their own members. And they wanted support in the area, particularly in the area of mental health, uh, which came out very strongly. So th those are the sorts of insights I think that are informing our way forward in Ulster. Another insight that we had uh, into our system during the year was a piece of work that we completed with uh, Sport Northern Ireland. And you know, for some of you, you'll say, "Oh, what's, what's this got to do with what we're we're talking about?" I think it's it's important that you can see there, you know, the whole talent identification and development system, pillar four. That uh, when we, we talk about the player journey, some of our, our players jump into that space for, for a period. But overall, we can see uh, a reflection of a system that um, that helps our players, I, th I suppose, along the way. And that's everything from our training facilities to our coaching provision and our coach development, uh, which Roger's going to touch on a little bit later. But also up on the top, uh, Pillar 5 here, athletic and post-career support. And I was quite interested that John picked up on that and, and referenced Ryan Mellon, uh, one of our own staff here. And Ryan has been getting in and out of schools, uh, actually delivering uh, a workshop, if you want, on uh, athletic development, and particular the whole area of lifestyle and lifestyle management. And I thought that was interesting, particularly for, for a man like Ryan, who has so much experience. Uh, this particular model helps us, I suppose, get a wee bit of structure. I think if there's a weakness in this model from a GA perspective, it's the whole international competition, Pillar 8. And uh, I'm a, definitely a fan of, of trying to get our players international exposure because when we, we go to engage with uh, you know, funders and government and, and sports council, we always feel we're at a, we're, we're not really referred to as an elite sport, uh, even though those of us that are, are involved and have played at probably at the top level know the commitments and the, the fitness levels that our, our top players uh, actually are engaged in. I suppose everybody on the, on, the, on, the, on the session here this morning is what I would call a master craftsman uh, or craftswoman. With any system, uh, we need to know what the different parts of the system do. Uh, we have a, a plumber here down in the bottom, a master craftsman, someone who knows his system. And uh, just like the plumbing system, the key craftsmen set it up, they make it work. Uh, all of the bits need to be working in unison to make it effective and efficient. The craftsperson needs to learn and be able to put into practice their craft. They need to do it with confidence and with competence. And they need to communicate with others responsible for different parts of the system. They need to manage the environment to suit the customer. Uh, and I think we as coaches are constantly learning and refining our craft. And as volunteers or as employed staff, uh, every day is classroom day. We're always learning. And it's fantastic that so many people have actually come on this morning to, to the session. But any system, I suppose, is, is underpinned uh, by values. Uh, and this... <laughs> This rings true with myself even at the, at the moment. Values, I think, is a word that's used quite loosely in conversations. But uh, values are something that are in place to guide our actions and our behaviours. And normally when you do this sort of thing, the first one up is respect. But do we put it into practice as coaches? Uh, does that go to the, the door? Do, or Sorry, do we go to the door? Does that go to the... Uh, to the, the scrap heap, if you want, when uh, a referee makes a poor decision and we decide to, to call him out on it. So our actions is also related to our knowledge, our professional knowledge about coaching and our ability to transfer this knowledge onto the pitch. Both of these are underpin what I call the primary functions here, uh, as you can see in the, in the yellow boxes. Uh, so for a moment, what I want you to do is just reflect as a coach, and I want you to score yourself across these six uh, key primary function areas. And I'm going to ask you the question and just write the number down uh, when, you, when you score yourself. How well do you set a vision and a strategy for your season? And one is very poorly and five is excellent. So give yourself a score there, one, two, three, four, or five. How well do you shape and manipulate the environment? And I'm making reference here just to the coaching environment. How well do you shape and manipulate the environment? So I want to five there as well. How well do you actively build relationships? And I'm talking here just with players. Forget about the others. How well do you actively build relationships with players? 
poorly or excellently? How well do you make your sessions challenging, varied, relevant to the needs of the player? Again, one, never, or five, frequently. The fifth one there, how well do you read the game and make the right decisions on the sideline? One is poor and five is excellent. And six, how well do you reflect on decisions made in a game or in a session? So let's take it in a game. How well do you reflect on the decisions made in the game after it's over? So I suppose potentially there you have a six by five, you have a score of 30 points you could be making. I'm not going to ask you to tell us your scores, but if you want, jot them in the box there uh, on the chat bar. Uh, but what I would say is uh, from a maximum of 30, if we're scoring in around 15, 20, uh, you know, is that is that good enough? Uh, and I would suggest that if we're saying it's good enough, it probably isn't good enough because we, we want to get higher than that. So there's a few people have put their scores in, 15. So I'm able to see Ronan. Okay, so just a, a couple of maybe takeaway messages there. Liver values and manager behaviours as coaches. Uh, I myself got into a tussle with a referee. I'm not saying a physical tussle, but certainly um, the uh, when you're on the sideline, sometimes your own emotions build build up when your when your team is playing, uh, and you've got to manage those. It's very important that if we say we need to show respect to the referee, that we, we live that value. Okay, vision, values, cultural awareness, relationships, the environment. So the primary functions have been outlined, and these are underpinned by vision, values, cultural awareness, relationships, and the environment. <laughs> Excuse me. I listened to a webinar this week about vision and values. The presenter made the point that it wasn't about words on the walls, but about living it visible in behaviours and in actions. And I agree totally with the sentiments. The pictures that we show here uh, about the environment help create the cultural awareness and positive relationships nurture and embed ambition and dreams of being like their role models. And I don't know who took this photograph of Michael Murphy and this young fella here in Donegal, but I, I think it paints a, a thousand words. So this is the domain of the coach, but players also need to realise that they, that they have a role as role models uh, and uh, uh, support that they, they practise that. Coaches do build relationships, and the one on the left here I think is an iconic picture at this stage. And I think uh, as coaches in the GEA, we do work to build relationships with our players. Uh, building and nurturing relationships with players is a huge undertaking for a coach because simply it's time consuming. Uh, getting to know the person, what makes them tick, what's going on in their life, it takes time. And quite often as, as, as volunteer coaches, we really don't have that time. We're, we're there for two sessions a week and maybe a game at the weekend. I suppose uh, Tony mentioned it earlier, putting the arm around the person Early players in the 90s used to chat about Eamon Coleman, God rest him, and his skill at building relationships with the players. For those of us that may not have Eamon's personality, we still need to work at it. It may not be uh, our one important take it may be our one important takeaway from this particular session. I suppose just to focus on the on the report that came out, uh, like many reports over the years, uh, some of them have gathered dust. Uh, and I don't really want to delve too much into the, this actual report. Um, I suppose the mission on the report is really to uh, develop our players holistically, develop people first, provide opportunities to develop knowledge, to empower players to engage in the challenges that they encounter in their player pathway. And I suppose uh, John mentioned it earlier, uh, the need to try and equip players uh, in the system to cope with what's coming down the line, uh, both immediately and, and long term. The report highlighted a number of things, but a couple of a couple that are relevant to this session uh, are that too often communication is is poor. Uh, there was a need for more joined up thinking. Uh, there was we need to work towards consistency and, and quality coaching. We need to manage the player workloads, and we need, need to drill down and provide support to players in the club. So, you know, I have to say the, the, the first session really ties nice and tightly with what we're trying to to put across here. Okay, so within the framework, within the, the report, we have this, L, this what they call F10 framework. Uh, in Austria, we've used the LTAD framework to structure our thinking on pathways. This report has adopted the FTM framework, which is really an Australian framework that reflects the journey of the, the journey or the pathways that the player can take. This is not a huge difference from the frameworks that we've been using, bar how they are presented. F1 and F2 reflects the excellent work being done 
basically uh, that are clubs and our nurseries and our primary schools. Uh, F3, the big blue circle, is really our club environment. And you can see there it's broken to youth and adult. Uh, the T space is the talent space where some of our young players from our clubs and our schools uh, veer off into this, this talent space. T1 and 2 are the early stages. T3 and 4 are the latter stages. Uh, and then the transition here into senior county or E1 elite phase or back into the club scene. Uh, I think what is significant are the number of critical junctions within this framework. There's one of them outlined there, transition from T4 into E1. But I think there are more critical junctions that we're probably uh, not paying attention to. T1 and T2 coming into a development system. A young player coming from a, from a small club, maybe coming into a system where he's now with his peers and people who are equally as good as, as what he is, uh, need to be managed. T3 and 4 being managed through the system. And in particular, T4, if they're not making it into the next step uh, within the county, how are we be managing these young players back into the club scene? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Or managing them out of the development screen. Likewise, the players that don't move from F3 to T1, but continue in the club uh, and then make the jump, as, as Tony was alluding to earlier, from the club into elite, from F3 into elite. And if they haven't been in this particular uh, system here, this, this talent development system. So how are those managed? Our challenges as coaches is how well do we manage the transitions? That's the point I'm trying to get across here. All right, so within this then, the, the, the report asks us to focus on the player, the game and the environment. Uh, and I know that Roger's going to talk a wee bit about this as well, uh, so we're not going to overlap. So look at the player uh, and talk about the key attributes that we're trying to achieve within our players. And, and we have those just outlined there. Likewise, they talk about the game and what we're trying to achieve through our games. Uh, and looks like a game player-centred and there's constant decision-making. So th that's a challenge for us as coaches to try and manage that. And then finally, the environment. It looks at some of the key people in the environment. And as, as John talked about earlier, the need to communicate and, and get these people linked up and, and talking. So that's very important, I think, uh, Part of what we're trying to do. Player-centred, I don't want to get bogged down in, uh, but something as far back here, a talent development high performance plan that we put together back in 2011, we, we talked about this and uh, <clears throat> I, I find it very difficult to be totally player-centred when you're, when you're dealing with 40-odd uh, people in a, in a squad. So how do we get around all the players and, and get to know them? How do we make individual decisions? How do we help them make their individual decisions as individual players? How do we help them deal with their personal issues and their challenges? Uh, we say we need to know the person and their environment, but it is a challenge for volunteers, uh, and uh, we're, we're not we're not uh, undermining that anyway at all. Right, player progress. This is potentially a, a player, and you can see they could be into an academy, they could be out of an academy. It could be dropped from academy just before exams. It could be a bad injury. It could move on to higher education and freshers. It could be dropped in an environment where, um, you know, they're away from home. Uh, they could start to develop some lifestyle issues. They could maybe get selected then for Seagerson at a, long, at a later date or if it's given. Uh, they leave college or into a work environment. Uh, so the player's pathway, and most people on the call here have been probably through something like this. There are troughs and there are peaks, and uh, we need to be there for, for the player as, he, as they move through this particular uh, particular scenario. Okay, so a wee bit of research that uh, we did as well with uh, some of our coaches um, when we talked about you know, what they were trying to achieve in a, in a coaching environment. Uh, and these are the words that the, the coaches came up with. Um, you know, so I suppose we can reflect again ourselves as coaches. Do do we do this sort of thing in a in a in a coaching environment uh, when we set up our sessions? Mark talked earlier about being fun and friendly. Very important that the, the people, no matter at what level of that player pathway, continue to enjoy what they're doing. Uh, it's developmental, but it's also challenging and, and players are forced to make decisions because that's what we have to do when we get into a game scenario. We have to make decisions. So it's important that that's built into our sessions. I fire this up because I think this, this is very important for all of us to understand. And I think it, it sort of reiterates the need for better communication. Uh, at the center here, you have this player 
uh, and each player in your in your squad will have different ambitions. Some will want to play for the county, some won't. Some will just want to turn up on a Sunday. Some want to do the extra training. You have different personalities. You have Aaron talked about the biological age or you know their developmental age. Uh, some are better, more resilient than others. Uh, some manage transitions better than others. But the player at the center of this is dealing with all of this other stuff around it. Now we could spend a full hour on this, and I'm not prepared to do that. But again, it, it looks at the academy, the school, and, and the GA club, but also other sports clubs. You know, kids could be playing other sports outside of Gaelic games. Uh, it talks about their friends, what's their what's their their, their peers, uh, their, their 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 the circle of people that they engage with. But up on the top right, uh, just before I go into that, up at the top here, their family, you know. Is there parental interest in what they're doing? Is there role models? What's their socioeconomic position? Have they siblings? Is there peer learning going on? Are they getting the right food? So these things are also important in the, in the development of a player on their journey. But up here in the top right, I have a significant adult. And what is the significant adult? You know, who is the significant adult? When you have a player who is, who is coaches and, and these different uh, contexts, inside GA, outside GA, you have players who have, uh, have uh, a family who are engaging with them. Their friends are inputting what they're... Who does this significant adult... Uh, who is this significant adult in terms of uh, bouncing things off? Who is, the, who is the player mentor? Sometimes they have someone, other times they don't. And I think that that's important that we realise that as coaches. Who is the significant adult? I suppose a quick story on a seminar that we were running... Uh, a number of years back now, I was asking the question about the dual player, a talented dual player in that particular county. Uh, some of his coaches were in the room. And when I asked the question, who took ownership of this player, there was silence. And eventually his father, who, who was in the audience and who was a prominent player himself, said, I did. Uh, but not all young players are lucky to have a, a, maybe a parent who has that knowledge and is prepared to uh, provide that level of support. So as we move forward, we want to try and create an environment of better communication, cooperation and sharing of information and ideas. Uh, lighten the load on the players and on the coaches uh, as well by, by sharing what we're trying to achieve. OK, I'm coming to near the end here. So uh, I suppose without jumping into Roger's space, I just wanted to, to maybe, I suppose, set the scene in terms of uh, a joint curriculum for 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 education. Uh, if we have these range of people down the left hand side here who are potentially uh, who are potentially, I suppose, contributing to the player uh, along their journey, then there needs to be some sort of a joint curriculum where people can follow what they should be doing at a particular time and a particular stage. Uh, and at the minute, we don't really have that. And that's something Roger, I think, is going to talk a little bit about uh, as we go through here. Joint curriculum and agree who can do what and then get this down into the clubs and to the schools as well as as well as well the academies. OK, so uh, just the, the last two slides here around coach development. Uh, I suppose one of the things that we're, we're trying to achieve moving forward is, is building capacity. And we've been very encouraged by the response to the online webinars that have been happening uh, and some of the vodcasts that have been uh, delivered for, for hurling, where we've had over a thousand people uh, accessing those uh, videos online uh, like for football and for hurling. So we want to try and build capacity. We want to try and get our, our clubs to have a club coaching plan. Uh, we want to develop some club coach to coach sessions within the club. And we want to develop communities of practice for our clubs as well. So that, that's some of the, the challenges that we have. Uh, <clears throat> we want our coaches on this session to engage with us uh, and stay with us. Uh, I don't think that you're coming on just to listen. We want you to share your knowledge, uh, and share your expertise and share your experiences because it's from those experiences that we really learn. Uh, and that's all our stuff at the bottom here, the, the planning process, coach to coach sessions. Those are all more formal things that we can actually help our clubs with and already we are we are doing that sort of work with our clubs, but all of this has to be balanced. I think with with uh, with this notion of being supportive and and, with, and, and being challenging. Uh, and Roger and myself back in 2017 attended a conference down in Dublin, uh, and Joe Schmidt, the 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 Ireland uh, rugby coach, talked about the 
the society that we're in in terms of bubble wrap in our ch children and our youth. And, you know, I think that the quotation there says that, that uh, whether as a coach, player, parent, or on another vocation, embracing failure as part of a journey towards improvement is crucial in the learning process. We do have to learn how to win and we do have to learn how to lose. And part of our role as, as coaches is not to bubble wrap children, but to help them uh, along the way in terms of winning and losing. I think that's that's very important as well as we move forward. So we have 10 takeaway messages there. I would say again that good enough isn't. All right, we need to be the best that we can be. Uh, that's where we want to be. So if we're only scoring 15 out of 30, then I think that that's good enough. Well, I think you know we need to sit and reflect on where we are and what we're trying to achieve and move that along a wee bit further. So the, these takeaway messages will be available online uh, after the conference. So we're, we're into just a quick uh, uh, question and answer session with, with, with Gareth here. And any questions that are coming up on the uh, coming up on the on the chat. So Gareth, would you like to come in there? Again, I just uh, I want to, to welcome Gareth. Uh, he's a parent, a teacher, a coach, a tutor, a coaching officer uh, in his past life. He's an academy's mentor and a senior county team backroom staff member. So he's been right through the the gambit of things that uh, that are required. So Gareth, you're very welcome. Yeah, I am Eugene. Yeah, thanks very much for the introduction there. You're, you're painting too uh, got a picture of me. I, I suppose I've been very fortunate uh, to be involved in so much in GA, and, and I've really enjoyed uh, my journey so far. But hopefully, th there's more to come to as well. But I suppose maybe to to build on on the presentation that you've uh, highlighted there, um, I, I suppose a, a big thing that we need to be aware of um, as coaches um, and as significant role models in um, players' lives is that we need to move away from the focus on a winning of all cost mentality. I, I suppose um, the, the COVID, the way it is, um, you know, all the coaches who are on this call here are probably sitting at home, scratching their heads, looking to see uh, what, what might they do with players uh, sort of in a, in a pre preseason mode. Um, but it, the big thing I, I want coaches to realise is it's not really about... Um, you know, winning the Monon Under-15 Championship or winning the McGorry Cup or winning the Ulster Minor Under-17 Championship, okay? I, I think we need to look and focus at really putting the player at the centre and really focusing on their development. And, um, you know, diff different thoughts come to mind when, when we look at this here. You know, how many times has an older uh, player been left on a bench and a younger, more talented player uh, played in front of him? just so silver can be won. How many times has a player been rushed back from an injury um, in order to you know, try and win that competition? Um, and, and the other thing we probably need to, to focus on and to build on the discussion uh, from Tony's fireside chat this morning is, you know, how many multiple teams do our players actually represent? Like, you know, for, for me, uh, you know, they're, they're probably on at least two club teams. Um, they're probably on two school teams. They're maybe on a development squad or Kenyan Iron team. Um, and that's not even if they're a dual player. You know, so you can multiply that by two. And then if, if they're involved in that, they could be involved in other codes as well. So that's like a minimum of maybe five uh, managers that they're servants to. And from my point of view, like we, we need to be thinking about the, the thought process that because players can be involved in a possibly a club uh, season, a school season, and um a development squad or a kind of minor season, that's possibly three pre-season windows that them players are facing in a 12-month calendar window. And I suppose, um, you know, Aaron highlighted for his conversation, like, you know, if we need a bit of joint up thinking here in terms of athletic development. And when that's, when's that done? And who's gone by? And who's going to benefit from that? Um, so really, you know, the top process really should be about players trying to achieve their potential and not really about, you know, the end of the year, a report at convention or the, or the club AGM and you know we want to thank uh, Eugene or Gareth for winning the trophy and representing the club and representing the school. It's about trying to transition the players uh, along the pathway so that they're going to represent the club at senior level, that they're going to maybe represent the school uh, at senior school team level or possibly go on then and represent their county um, at under 20s at senior level. I suppose there's a comment here from Stephen uh, Gareth that uh, 
I'd also go ask how many times disrespectful behaviour has been tolerated from a talented player just to win. You know, so there there is a there is a, an onus on uh, us as coaches, no matter at what level, to I suppose uh, embed. Uh, respect if that's a value that we hold close to our, to our chest. Yeah, you know, I mean, um, like when, when we meet up with uh, players on a Tuesday or Thursday or Saturday morning, you know, we set the tone with our own behaviour first and foremost. And, um, you know, monkey see, monkey do. And if pe- people see our behaviour is respectful, if we're respectful towards people, you know, the players are going to pick up on that too as well. Um, and I, I really feel though, and, and John highlighted um, in his talk earlier about the whole essence of a need for joint up thinking amongst all the stakeholders and, and I think that's really highlighted in the report um, um, What does that look like Gareth? What does joined up joined upness I have it down here as? What does joined upness look like? Yeah well that, that's obviously a very good question there and I suppose if we all have magic wands it, and, and it was simple we would have done it a long time ago but um, I, I suppose there's a couple of reasons why there isn't joint up thinking maybe to, to begin with you know, mo- as once again, most managers are only interested in their own competition for a start. They're only interested in their own window, um, rather than maybe looking at the long-term player pathway, which we, we need to address. Also, probably the, the fixture calendar maybe doesn't help. Um, I suppose back when I teach, started teaching in St. McCartan's um, College 20 years ago, there was only really a club season from um, April to September and a school season from October to April. And there wasn't really... Um, the family squads at that stage uh, and there's only really the county minors um, and maybe a crossover or a clash of successive senior school teams and, and county minor teams and there was always various arguments and screams over access to players but I, I think you know over the years the family squads come on board the club season got longer probably just been a bit of squeeze in school season but uh, from my point of view how we begin to get joint up thinking is actually communication communication amongst the stake- stakeholders and from my point of view, one of the things that we looked to try to address in St. McCartan's uh, pre-COVID was actually having a sort of a club liaison uh, person in the school. So someone was identified in the staff, uh, one of the maybe managers or coaches of the school football team, and we would have 14 clubs that would feed into us, and we would sit down on an evening and make contact with them coaches. You know, you know who's playing well for your team or who has played well for your uh, club team over the summer? Who should we be looking at? And then us feeding back the information, even say stuff in school, um, and, and John alluded to this too as well, we would do a lot of, say, maybe fitness testing work, give that information back to the clubs. Let the clubs know how their uh, players have, have progressed and how they're developing in an athletic development point of view. Also as well, um, I, I sort of uh, highlighted earlier, you know, my role as coaching officer in Modern GA, and uh, one of the things I, I did with Paul O'Connor we we'll sit down early in time and look at how we could build relationships. You know, how can schools feed into the balance squads? How can we have that communication? So for me, you know, it's really, really important that, you know, be that person who picks up the phone. Don't be waiting on the phone call. Be proactive and, you know, start that, that means communication. The other thing is, um, I suppose maybe that there's a lack of trust amongst different coaches um, about who's doing what and when they're doing it. But you, you highlighted there in the presentation a few minutes ago, you know, and what about this for a, minute, a bit of a radical thought? How about an age-specific uh, curriculum for players at under 13, 15, and under 17 level? How can we spread this over the three domains of club, school, and uh, county so that the player can really develop and not be worried about having to do um, a session for the school at lunchtime and then go off and do a session for the club in the even time? Or, you know, play a game for the school on a Wednesday and then doing a strength conditioning session the next uh, morning or the next evening. Um, you know, we, we need to think about how we're going to put the player at the centre and how the player is going to benefit in all this. Yeah. Some some great stuff there, Garrett, coming back there. And as I say, someone who is who's very embedded in the system. Uh, I suppose uh, you know, there, there are key issues around the fixtures, calendars, and I know... <laughs> I was going to say it's from your own county, but maybe that might put somebody behind the black ball. Uh, certainly, I, I remember um, f- a few years ago when we asked the, the fixtures makers to come to a meeting with the Provincial Council or the Provincial Coaching the Games Committee. Uh, and then when the fixture the fixtures person realised where they were going and you asked them to stop the car, jumped out and walked back into the town. You know, so I'm, I'm not having to go at fixtures makers here. We do need to 
have our, our governance side, our fixtures makers, our administrators on the same page as us as coaches. Uh, and I think that's something that we were trying to achieve now, but something that probably was lacking over the years. So we, we were having situations where academy players or development squad players were off on a Saturday morning doing their thing. And then that afternoon having uh, an under 14 or an under 15 or an under 16 game with their club uh, in the afternoon. So that's the sort of thing we want to try and avoid. Um, but the, the lack of trust is something I think we need to get over. Um, you know, nobody owns the player. If anybody owns a player, it's the family who owns a player, in my opinion. You know, yeah, yeah, there are no, children. I completely agree there, Eugene, because even, I suppose, uh, back in the day, um, you know, uh, I was very fortunate to be, to be manager of a school, um, under 16 and a half team, ran a fast team, that won a trophy um, for the first time in the school's history in 40 years. And, you know, for you know a good while afterwards, I was referred to them as my team. But they were never my team. They, they were a school team that I was forced to be manager of. You know yeah. what I mean? So um, it's, it's not about ownership. Like at the end of the day, the only real people that players are answerable to are their parents. You know what I mean? And, and parents probably need to be looking at what's going on in their child's life too as well. But um, it, it's not about my ego and it's not about my winning mentality. It's really it's about looking at how players do. And once again, you know, even from a school's point of view, and I, and I know a lot of um, time and uh, money has been spent on centers, centers of excellence, but like, you know, schools act as um, regional training hubs for a lot of work that could be done, say, in the area of athletic development. You know what I mean? Instead of dragging uh, players all over a county, um, especially maybe on a school night when homework has to be done or assignments have to be handed up, you know, could we, could we look at them maybe staying in a pod um, after school and, and other people you know, from different schools, maybe joining up there and, and looking and getting sessions in that way and, and regional coaches coming involved there and saving time from that point of view. Um, yeah. and, and it's really looking at, at the welfare of the player uh, first and foremost because um, I, I suppose the big buzzword in education really at the moment now is, is well-being. And we're spending a, a huge amount of time and emphasis in schools at the moment looking at, at the mental and physical health of students. Um, and there's a number of societal reasons why we do this. Uh, and I, I unfortunately don't have time to go into all that now, but I, I think we, uh, coaches on the call here uh, and in the clubs and in the schools and, and in and intercounty setups have to be aware of the pressures that are now being placed on um, students and players in their teenage years. And I, I, I thank my lucky stars that I'm no longer a teenager. I'm, I'm well past that stage. I, I don't know how I would uh, uh, survive in, in their world now, but you know the pressures that these kids face like they want to try and keep every manager happy like all they want to do is play they want, they want to wear the club jersey they want to wear the school jersey they want to wear the intercounty jersey and they're prepared and willing to do whatever it takes to do that but they're probably putting themselves and their body at risk of damage and harm by having that mentality mentality they're definitely afraid of getting injured they rush back from injury and i know there's a big uh, awareness campaign at the moment with concussion and we all need to be aware of that we need to be aware that you know, players need the, the, the proper time to get back in so that they, that they will develop then later on. Um, you know, they, they have issues and problems, you know, with relationships, um, you know, maybe their family, maybe their friends, maybe their romantic side. Um, and then on the academics as well, um, you know, the whole pressure with exams. And um, I know the, the schools in the six have, have canceled their exams. There's you know, a lot of chat at the moment whether, you know, the leaving cert's going to be going ahead or not. And that does put pressure on the students. You know, what's what's that uncertainty? What's going to be ahead of them? So you throw that into the mix and then people are yeah. putting the maximum to be a training session left, right, centre. You can imagine the pressure that, you know, these players are going to feel. Okay, Gerard, we have about probably two minutes left here. There's lots of comments coming in on the on the chat bar. So people can actually read those. Uh, they're not actually questions, they're just comments on, on what's going on. Uh, so just uh, I suppose I suppose a mentor of, of my own I suppose growing up and someone I had a, had a lot of time for was my, my old primary school teacher who actually coached in the club as well up through the system um, but I, I can remember one day he was talking about you know, different different players in the club and the talented players in the club uh, and he left one of the players off for a particular game and somebody asked you know why uh, and he made the comment about red rum, he says that red rum run, run in every race, and uh, one of the older players says no, he probably didn't. He says all I'm trying to do is manage this player, and uh, he was managing the horse, if you want, 
And I think we as coaches do need to be uh, careful how we manage the talented player. Sometimes it becomes all about the talented player. There's other players as well on the team that we have to manage, but the talented player is the one that's probably uh, the most vulnerable because of some of the demands that they're that, that they're being being placed on. And to be honest with you, quite often they're not only talented and and maybe sport, but they're also talented in other things. I can remember coaching a young lady uh, at basketball. Uh, she was 14, 13 at the time. Uh, and not only was she talented at, at basketball, but she was also on the Troon Lady Skilly Football uh, set up. She was a pianist. Uh, she was a top flight academic. Uh, and that, again, chatting to her mum, her mum was trying to manage that for her. Uh, and I think we, uh, again, as coaches, are probably blessed to have the loan of these young people in our care, uh, and we do have to we do have to work with them. I think finally, just to, you you've raised it, and uh, John raised it earlier as well. Is the relationship with the with the county uh, from schools? Uh, and you've alluded to your relationship with Paul. John alluded to his relationship with Chris Collins, uh, and I think that's maybe a takeaway message as well for all of our counties that we need to develop and nurture that relationship, have more joined up thinking, don't run the horse in every race, all right, be, be careful, manage the horse uh, and maybe we, we can make things move forward.